Why expand internationally? There's a lot of different reasons as to why anybody that's in business for a long period of time and has a medium-sized company needs to consider this, if not a small-sized company even. A large part of it is supply chain management, making certain that your product or your services really reach your desk the way they're supposed to. Even in the service sector, it is not uncommon for a CPA firm to have its clients bring in all the different receipts, all the different aspects that pertain to taxes, then sit down and have somebody enter them into a computer, ship them overseas to India, have an Indian accountant use the American tax code to sit down and, do, and, and complete the forms, and usually they do an extraordinarily good job, ship them back to the United States, and then the United States pay India 50, 55 hours to have the term return completed, and then turn around and charge 600 hours for a, their client to sit down and have their taxes done, and they might have spent 10% of that. That's not uncommon. That's why having that international expansion, having that connection to a different country and using their top talent to sit down and do something that you want to do in the service sector really makes a lot of sense. Pay attention to the availability of supplies. Sometimes the actual minerals are not here in the United States. They have done, so you have to ship them over or you have to find a new source. Lithium right now is being sought worldwide because of the, the, the electric vehicles and China has a massive reserve of all the different elements from cobalt to lithium, nickel, all the other parts that we use to make batteries. But they just found a brand new huge load over in South America. They call it the lithium triangle. We also have some here in California over at the Salton Sea over by, by Indio, California, as well as if you start looking to the, the middle of California, we have some here as well. Supplies are a big thing. Thinking about the opportunity of what new markets are, and EVs are a new market, lower labor costs though really drives down the cost. If you're trying to get something done, I'm working on a project now, and to have the project done over here simply puts it out of the reach of, of the actual consumer. So I'm looking at other countries in the process over here. So think about the low labor cost. That becomes a significant part of the actual cost of the overall vehicle to the point that it can make or break a company. Access to finance capital. There are countries that are dying to have industry in them. And if you had somebody coming in with a $10 million project over here in the United States, it's not a big deal. You put that in Indonesia and all of a sudden, whoa, a $10 million American funded project. All of a sudden the radar goes up and everybody's courting them nonstop with this small investment here is gigantic over there. Think, and then all the aspect of trying to avoid tariffs and import quotas. If you keep on coming from this country over here, they have a tariff on them. Oh, let's try it over here. Just change your company. So you're looking at a different aspect of all the opportunities that are out there. We normally have five different ways to expand. It just depends who is out there and what is out there in the process. You have global outsourcing where you're ordering materials from another country coming over here. Oftentimes, they're really subject to tariffs if they're appropriate, but really the global outsourcing can reduce your overall labor costs substantially, but may put the neighbors down the street out of, out of a job, but, but that's okay, I'm going to get rich in the process. It kind of sounds like an ethical issue. Anyway, so importing, exporting, counter trading, really the import, export, always keep in mind in management that import, you're bringing stuff in, you're buying and exporting, you're selling. Import, buy, export, sell. Always keep that little rhythm in your head because sometimes when you're when you're in a deep conversation about it, you can get them confused if you don't have them precisely figured which way they're doing. And then counter trading, going back and forth. One of my former students, she works in the supply chain, and by, by a freak sense, I was actually creating a new supply chain management here at IBC. She called me up and she wanted some tips on negotiating. Well, okay, so, so I gave her a couple tips, you know, always make certain that you can sit down and give them something extra. Why should they commit to your deal? By the time it was all done, she had a 60% reduction on the deal that she cut and, and with existing stuff because that one company had an exclusive supply chain issue. She told him pretty clearly, I want to have this reduced, but also for you, if you do this, I want to do the following three projects and I want to sign the three-year contract. All of a sudden, boom, 
everything clicked into place. She looked good because of the fact she negotiated that. And on top of that, she actually opened up the market with this other company on a three-year deal plus additional products. They, came, they went from having just a little uh, fingers touching to handshaking nonstop in the partnership. It was fabulous because she suggested the counter trade with an overseas company over in Europe. Another way is licensing and franchising. You remember the illustration in the last pod, pod class? We talked about Harley, Harley Davidson cigarettes. Harley Davidson doesn't make cigarettes. They were licensing that brand label and that brand label was selling the cigarettes all by itself. Licensing is a pretty common thing. Starbucks, if you look at Starbucks, Starbucks has corporate stores. There are no franchises for Starbucks. There's licensees. So if you already have an established business and you contact Starbucks, Starbucks will consider licensing out their product and their name to you to sell and they make money off of it by licensing. They don't franchise. Now franchising is a little bit differently in the aspect that the company actually gets a percentage of overall sales. So in other words, seven and a half percent. You open up this over here, a McDonald's franchise. Okay, if you open that over in Malaysia, you have this over here and you have a franchise. It's still controlled by corporate, but the aspect of the franchise, that's a good way to expand in regards to actual out there. So you have that, that out there. Joint ventures. Sometimes you can't get into a country unless the majority of the company is owned by a national from that country. It's not a bad idea, but they're protecting their own business people. And frankly, to some extent, maybe government should be doing that more often. But if you want to establish a good joint venture, that's an opportunity to sit down there and have a partner. And the, the, you have the advantage of having a partner in the other country that knows all the customs and can sit down and help guide you and you both have great success. It's a brilliant strategy. And then you also have wholly owned subsidiaries. Normally you have, if you're doing a wholly owned subsidiary, you normally end up having an international corporation where you end up with selling stock on that country's stock exchange. You have uh, managers running the company in that in the different uh, facilities there that are actually nationals of that country and you have that whole aspect structure but having wholly owned subsidiaries. We have several of them here in the United States from other countries including Japanese automakers, German automakers where they have the parts made in the other country they assemble them over here but the corporation and the company and the factory are owned by the actual home corporation in their home country. But still, they're actually doing business here and, and they're employing American workers for assembly and American workers get paid and they buy their product. That's kind of what it's about. So here's five ways to expand internationally. I want you to know these for the academic part of this class. Hint, 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 that could be on the test. But the other part, if you're serious about being in management, having these things roll off your tongue in the aspect of talking to your boss, People start thinking more of you in the process, so pay attention to what this is. Barriers, international trade, there's a lot of them. There's major trading blocks. You also have most favored nation trading status, which can be a really big deal, and the different exchange rates. Tariff, no matter what, a tariff is a tax. If you buy something from China, and China has a list of tariffs, you have to be careful if you can. I was buying stuff from China, and I, I ended up bought a shipment coming from China, and the way that the manufacturer coded it, I had to pay a 20% tax on it. Well, a 20% tariff. So that said, the, the gal I was using here on this end over here, she says, well, no, it should be classified over here. She reclassified it and saved me 10% of the overall item. She paid her expenses plus a lot more on top of that. Tariffs are a tax and the person that's buying it is the one that pays the tax to the government. Okay, so with that said, when they manufacture, they, they sell it to you and then you end up paying the tariff, which is a tax, not them. Sometimes you'll have import quotas. You know, it's interesting that uh, once upon a time, uh, Toyota, they had an import quota on two-seated pickup trucks. Well, they ended up having a, having a regular two-seated pickup truck and they started bolting on in the, in the, in the truck bed on the, on the small size pickup trucks back in the 70s and 80s. They were bolting on plastic cheap chairs in the bed of the truck and they put two of them. So all of a sudden it was a four-seat pickup truck. Well, they were just <laughs> trying to go around the import quotas and it worked for about seven years. Um, sometimes you also have embargoes and sanctions. 
we have that we have a long time embargo on Cuba because of its relationship with its government and its people and, and the United States as well as other countries. This is when you start shutting off the spigot of all goods going to and from that country from you. So you have those going on. And these are ways that you put barriers up to international trade. You know, is a barrier a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it just depends who you are. If you are the guy working down the street who has a job working in a General Motors plant and all of a sudden they lift all the tariffs and all of a sudden that anybody could buy a more inexpensive form car and that person's out of work, he's going to say, tariffs, tariffs, give me a good tariff. Okay, he'll say that. But if you're the consumer looking to save $12,000 on a brand new car, you're going to say, drop the tariff, drop the tariff. It depends what hat you're wearing at the moment. So three organizations, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. You know, I seldom endorse a lot of these organizations in the aspect of their goals, except for the fact that a couple of, one of them, that the World Trade Organization, they actually have a methodology to actually try to reduce the amount of international competition on taxation. And the World Bank has a program for low income uh, people, individuals to sit down and be able to start their own business. Some really good things out there. You have to know about trade blocks. The USMCA, United States Mexico Canada Trade Agreement. You know, the old version was called NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, and that was nice. This one is even better because what ended up happening was we opened up the borders of Canada and Mexico, but you know, we had some problems. Mexico did not have the strict environmental laws that we in Canada have, so they had to beef up their whole aspect of it, and now that it's improved, they also had improved their transportation because they had uh, trucks and trailers that were disintegrating and dragging down the highways, and they were coming across the United States. They had to beef that up too. It improved that and also raised the wages to an awful lot of Mexicans. And now we had the United States, the number one trade partner used to be for decades, two decades, was China. Now the number one trademark, the, the trading partner for us is Mexico. Yes. Okay. And Canada. China's still up there, but they're trading, they're trading partner number three for the United States. So this thing has really worked and it's improved the overall economy, especially of Mexico and Canada and the United States. It's a win, win, win process. Trading blocks can really help in the process. You see a couple right there. Sometimes if you don't join together, you get into a fight like a couple of cats. In the process, there's a picture of that over there. But that most favored nation status is a big deal because it may not be part of the trade block, but the reality that extending that special uh, the deference of most favored nation, all of a sudden you try to work together to reduce the tariffs and the barriers of trade. So why expand it internationally? Get that special gold star by your name and you get most favorite status. Are tariffs good? Yes. Are tariffs bad? Yes. That's the answer. Okay, but on the test question, you better know what they are. Quotas and trade protection, they're good and bad. It just depends what hat you're wearing at the moment. And trade blocks. And remember, we have a really good one called the USMCA. And hopefully, it'll survive the next scrutiny round as we go through. Because that has helped both countries, the United States, as well as two partners of Canada and Mexico. And now we have a good articulated agreement across borders for that trade block. And maybe we'll expand that even more in the days to come. Take care.